Good afternoon. Two men died within a week of each other. One man died in London, England. The other man died in France, outside Paris. They were both great Europeans. They died at a time when such men have become exceedingly rare, almost, I would say, extinct. The man who died in France was Leon Blum, the former prime minister. The man who died in England was Professor Harold Lasky. They were both Jews. They were both great social philosophers. And as social philosophers and idealists, and social reformers, they belong in this series. Today, I want to talk to you about Harold Lasky. He died a short time ago on lay in England at a comparative young age of 56. Of course, the 56 years of Harold Lasky were the most fruitful and creative, particularly the last 25 years of his life, of any life, of any professor, I should say, in this century. I say a professor because to most people who knew Lasky only by name knew him as Professor Lasky, the English intellectual socialist, the author of uh, 20 books on political theory and social philosophy, political economy and history, not to mention the innumerable articles, essays, reviews, pamphlets, and lesser journalistic writings which could fill a little library by themselves. Lasky was a most prolific writer. He could write easier a volume than anybody else could write an essay. And Lasky wrote nothing which did not bear his exquisite, lucid, simple, Laskian style, which became, so to speak, his trademark. He wrote almost as he spoke and lectured, with a grand, dry kind of English humor and irony. And remember that he wrote about subjects that were even to intellectual readers difficult reading. He wrote about dry problems. I do not think that there has been any writer in England, including Bernard Shaw, in the last half century, who used a more distinguished prose in non-fiction than Harold Lasky. Neither was there a writer wittier and a more precise talker of English than Lasky. Churchill that arch master of England in real life, that is, not on the platform or in the House of Commons, the English Parliament, or before a microphone on the radio, is not a great talker. Churchill needs a big audience. Churchill needs a multitude of people, millions of men. He needs a world to listen to him. Otherwise, it seems that it isn't worth his while to be a grand speaker. Lasky, no less a grand master of English, needed only one pair of ears, preferably intelligent ears. And you could hear that not one sentence was sloppy or careless or muddled or smelling of heavy professorial sweat and mustiness of libel. And it is curious that Lasky the social democrat, the man who all his life wanted to serve the people, used sometimes a more elegant, I nearly said a more aristocratic, uh, pardon me, a more elegant English than a Churchill, the supreme aristocrat. And Lasky never stooped down to the vulgarities of a demagogue. Lasky was not a great public speaker never of the Churchillian type of speaker. At first, Lasky spoke with such a pronounced Oxford accent that this alone would have been enough to erect a sort of wall between an average British audience and him. Secondly, his Oxfordian voice was not meant for rebel rousing, neither was it meant for emotionalism or sentimentality or the mere tricks of a great order. Lasky's voice, clear but not too strong, precise but not pedantic, was the voice of reason. It was the voice of a logical mind. It was the voice of a scholar, of a thinker, of a great intellect who sees things rationally, reasonably, 
and with a logic which is irrefutable with rational argument. He was also sparkling with wit, with it what the French call esprit, and with a sardonic humor. He could, no less than Churchill, be devastating with his irony and satire. I was privileged to know Harold Blessed. I will tell you what he was like practically. Not the great Professor Lasky, the most eminent English social scientist, but the human, the charming, the tactful, the warm-hearted man who was ready and uh, always ready to give help, to give advice, and not to spare himself for the same time. But may I first tell you what part Lasky played in English intellectual life? Not only in the labor movement. Harold Lasky was born in Manchester 56 years ago. His father was a distinguished Jewish scholar and well-to-do businessman. <coughs> Pardon me. With a liberal mind as well as a liberal hand and heart. His social activities, his philanthropy, his genuine largesse and the great bequests that he made were famous not only in Manchester. Nathan Lasky's home was open to every scholar and student, writer and artist, and political rising star. In the first decade of this century, a young politician, for instance, then a liberal, <coughs> pardon me, he came into Nathan Lasky's house. He had all the support and encouragement from Nathan Lasky. That young man was then running, we call it standing in England, for Parliament for the first time. Nathan Lasky helped that young man to win his first parliamentary seat. It was in Lasky's home that his first campaign started, his first political campaign, and there it was that was worked out. And that young man won thanks to Nathan Lasky. The name of that young member of parliament was Mr. Winston Churchill. Harold Lasky had all his life a critical admiration for Churchill, although they belonged to opposite poles in their political and intellectual outlook. Churchill, I'm told, had a great respect for Lasky's amazing erudition and moral honesty. Although, politically, he considered him a dangerous rebel. And Lasky, of course, looked at Churchill as the last survival of that great and almost extinct species of the 18th century Grand Tory aristocrat. A worthy scion of the Duke of Marlborough, but whose political philosophy could as much solve the present day economic problems and the political problems in this world as much as the musket of Marlborough's foot soldier could compete with a rocket bomb, let alone with the atom bomb. Then let me tell you here how that wise grand old man Churchill, for whom it is impossible not to have the greatest admiration, and who will go down in history as the greatest war leader of the democratic world, the great architect of the victory over Hitler and Mussolini, the men who held the torch of freedom when the light went out in Europe, and England alone, Churchill's England, as well as Lasky's England, was the only unconquerable and undaunted fortress of mankind's last hope. Now, it is St. Churchill made the greatest blunder after the victory. When he suffered a resounding personal defeat at the elections in Britain, the first 
post-war election in 1945. A defeat from which he did not recover even five years later, in March 1950. Uh, and uh, the real cause of Churchill's defeat. Uh, I have no hesitation in saying is that he underestimated the political strategy, the strategy of Harold Lasky. Yes, it was Harold Lasky who planned the victory of the Labour Party. It was Lasky who was the brain and intellect behind the Labour Party's plan to win the British people, to have planned the peace out of the chaos of war. It was Harold Lasky who made the blueprints for this victory. But Tusky was not overconfident in the Labour Party. As a matter of fact, he was so cautious, he was so careful in his planning, knowing that there was no more popular hero as a war leader in British history since the Spanish Armada. And whose splendour shown no less than Nelson's or Wellington, and certainly outshone in the eyes of the world, not only England, but the eyes of the world, the Welsh wizard David Lloyd George at the end of the First World War. Now Lasky knew this better than anybody else, and that's why he was so cautious not to diminish Churchill's talent, his genius, his tremendous personality, his supreme qualities of courage and tenacity. What last he counted on was simply the extraordinary political good sense and maturity of the British people who have learned in the last few hundred years that war leaders don't make good peace leaders. Of course, that the psychology and the temperament of a war leader are altogether different from the psychology and temperament of a constructive peace builder. It is a duller job, it is true, but one needs to have sometimes dull men for dull jobs. And uh, the British people who defeated defeated and threw stones in his window. In the days of Wellington, the men who brought down Napoleon, when Wellington wanted to be a leader in peace. Same British people who defeated David Lloyd George, who brought down the Kaiser when he wanted again to become Prime Minister. after the war was won. And so Lasky had hoped that the same good sense will guide the British people and they will thank Churchill for his unsurpassed leadership in war, but will not entrust them with the more precise duties of building a decent peace with such unromantic things as bread and butter, or even margarine, or milk of housing, of steady employment, of public health, of transforming a war economy into a constructive peace economy. In other words, all such unspectacular problems which cannot be cured with the most magnificently sweeping oratory in cadences of a Cicero or even a church. Uh, that was last week's hope that the British people will rather choose a less heroic or romantic man, but rather a prosaic man whose only concern will be the reconstruction of a life of, of the life of the people, and a less with the splendor of a Shakespearean character speaking in a sublime Elizabethan tongue. Uh, Lasky hoped that England would rather entrust the humdrum business of peace to men of Atlas character than to the dramatic actor of genius, Winston Churchill. And with his hope in his mind, Lasky worked for a labor leader. 
church with you, at last he stands behind labor staff. And this was his greatest blunder, Churchill made. Now he tried, with irony and ridicule, to attack Harold Dusky personally. And in one of his last radio speeches before the election, he called Lasky the professor. Uh, you know, with that Churchillian uh, twist. The professor whom the country does not know. And this professor is trying to transform England into a socialist land with a Gestapo. Now, he's where he's where. Uh, I heard that speech, and I remember saying to a friend, Churchill will pay for that man. Now, you see, Lasky, although, of course, neither the popular men of a Churchill nor the active politician, but only the chairman of the Labour Party, was nevertheless a name most honoured in England for his honesty and moral courage and intellectual eminence. Uh, for Churchill to turn Harold Lasky into uh, a doctrinaire, obscure little professor who will establish the Gestapo, that was a bit too safe. Uh, what's more, in England such things are not done. It was not fair play. In England you don't attack a political opponent personally by calling him a professor. It's not cricket, we call him. And the result, as you all know, it was the little professor who made possible the defeat of the great church. Harold Dutsky was the most brilliant mind that the British socialism has produced. You could agree with him or disagree with him, but no one doubted his superb intellectual gifts, his extraordinary moral zeal, his high ethical principles. He was a reformer with a great moral passion for justice. As a teacher, he was unique. At the London School of Economics, which he helped to make a world famous, Lasky was the most popular lecturer of political science. His brilliant academic career, which started in 1914 when he was lecturing in Canada and in the United States universities until 1926, when he was still a very young man. He was the intimate friend and advisor later of President Roosevelt. In Justice Home, that great American wrote about Lasky many years ago to the great English judge Pollock that he has never met a more brilliant mind than Harold Lasky. And Judge Frankfurter had the highest esteem of Lasky. I remember sitting with Lasky in his little study in London. There were three portraits on the wall, one of Judge Frankfurter, one of Justice Holmes, and the other one of President Bush. But not only amongst the uh, very eminent in the world, but thousands of students from many lands who were fortunate to learn from Dusky remembered him with admiration and love. And yet, he was not only love, oh, he was actually hated, hated, and abused, and insulted, too, but by whom? He was hated in England by the outsiders, and, curiously enough, by the communists. Curious, isn't it? But that's how it is. Very few people realize what strange better the worst reactionaries had. Just as here in America, Lasky was tremendously attacked as the man who advised Roosevelt on his new deal. And on his last visit to this country, University of California, counseled at the last moment Lasky's two lectures because he advocated academic freedom. In this same Lasky, who was always most violently attacked men by Moscow and his satellites, was looked upon by the Westbrook peglers and their kind 
as a fellow traveler, if not as secret boxer. But Lasky was in reality the most hated man by the communists, because they knew that his integrity, his social critique of communist dictatorship was the most devastating criticism that can be brought against that regime of intellectual and moral and economic slavery. Harold Lasky, stupendous mind and soul, lived in a very frail body. He was never a strong man. And I was told that he carried on his person in the last few years instruction what to do with him should he suddenly become unconscious in his lecture room or in his feet. He suffered from a very weak heart. He also had lung trouble. He was expecting death any day, but not for one minute did he seize his anxious task, writing, teaching, lecturing, attending to conferences, having an innumerable correspondence with literally thousands of people in all lands. Though he was primarily an internationalist, he thought about himself as a Jew, a Briton, and a socialist. He was, like many a socialist and Jew in Britain, deeply disappointed in the Labour government policy, particularly about Palestine. Lasky always a staunch Zionist, did not shrink from a devastating attack on very unfortunate Palestine policy. But he had great confidence in England. He believed in it, and in a good sense of his future. And it was mainly thanks to his influence that the wound in the Anglo-Israeli relations began to heal. Let us hope that better that the bitter memories will be completely wiped out. And as to America, Lasky, who was recognized as the man who, since Lord Bright, knew American history, politics, and law better than any other Englishman, Lasky had a great faith in the democratic vitality of this land. And he believed that America will live up to the expectation of the free world. His book, The American Presidency, and his monumental study on the United States are already flat, but living flat. With Lasky, a great English Jew passed away, a man who took the Jewish prophet seriously, a man for whom social justice freedom and equal opportunity were not mere cliches. With Lasky, a great European with a clear vision for a saner society past the world. But the free spirit of man has got a great habit in the world that Lasky leaves behind with us. Good afternoon.